What do we know of Imam Ahmad's consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? For example, Imam Ahmad showed huge caution from ever speaking without knowledge. He was not afraid to say, I don't, I don't know. Because he recognized that speaking on behalf of Allah and his messenger without sure knowledge is in fact signing on behalf of them both. So I want to share with you a few statements in this regard attributed to Imam Ahmad. How he answered many of the questions. These are all translations. I have not heard anything in this regard. I have not heard of it. I don't know the issue, the ruling issue in it. I don't have the courage to speak of it. I don't have answers in this matter. I don't have an answer. Ask someone else. Ask the scholars. I fear answering this question. It terrifies me. It's an unclear matter. It's an intricate topic. It's problematic. There is a difference of opinion. They have deferred. I prefer to stay safe. I prefer well-being. Please relieve me of this question. These are different sentences attributed to Ahmad all throughout his life to show you he was not afraid. He was so conscious of Allah, scared to answer without knowledge. His, his biography is an academy of lessons. And one of the most important of them is freezing at the limits. Humility to the truth and the courage to say, I don't know. This was the behavior of Ahmad. Although, subhanAllah, he may have actually memorized hundreds of narrations pertaining to the question that he had just declined to answer, but because he is unsure of the strongest opinion, he says these things, I don't know the answer. Don't think it is a mind blank. Hundreds of narrations are there, but he's unable to declare which is the strongest. Ahmad was also very troubled by the levels of fame that he had reached particularly after the trial that he experienced. Towards the latter years of Imam Ahmad, he would say, I want to live in a remote valley, somewhere in Mecca, where no one will recognize me. I have been afflicted with fame, and so I desire death every morning and evening. He saw fame something that some of us may crave today, he saw it as an affliction, and therefore he was asking Allah for death because of it. And it was also once said to him, there are so many people who are making dua for you. And upon hearing this, Ahmed's eyes flooded with tears, and he said, I am so scared that this may be a sign that I am being baited to my destruction. So don't put it past yourself. Don't put it past yourself. What is fasting? What is charity? What is the recitation of the Quran? What is prayer in congregation? What is your flawless hijab? If it is tarnished with this ujub, this self-admiration that we have spoken about before, even a trace of its poison is sufficient to tear down years worth of good deeds. And that's why our predecessors were so afraid of it. And what is even worse is that we rarely own up to this. I mean, you hear people saying, Hey, look, it's, I, I have pure intentions, or it doesn't bother me whether one person follows me or a million person follows me. Akhi, please, that's quite an unrealistic statement to make. Be honest with yourself and realize you are being trialed. Ibrahim ibn Adham once traveled to another city and he entered within a particular garden. And the news spread that the great Imam Ibrahim ibn Adham was now in the city, this, this Imam in piety and religion. And, so everyone knows about him. So everyone came into the garden and they hadn't seen Ibrahim ibn Adham before. And so they began to say, where is Ibrahim ibn Adham? Where is Ibrahim ibn Adham? So what did Ibrahim do? Fearing fame, he began to walk around with them saying, where is Ibrahim ibn Adham? Where is Ibrahim ibn Adham? And Ibrahim ibn Adham himself, he would say, ma sadaq Allah abdun ahabba shuhra. Any person who loves fame, has not been true to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Something to think about and something to inform your decisions as well. What do we know about the trial of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal? Ya Allah, it seemed as if all of the events of Ahmad's life were leading him towards this one moment where he would need to remain firmer than mountains. At a time when all others around him would crumble. A trial 
that would cost Ahmed 17 years of his life in total. In fact, I, I believe that any biography that speaks of Imam Ahmed that does not make mention of his trial is unforgivably deficient. See, the Muslim Ummah up until this point in Ahmed's life was by and large upon the belief, the theology, the creed of the predecessors, the companions, saying that Allah speaks and that speech is an attribute of Allah, a speech, of course, that befits His Majesty and glory. And that the Qur'an is part of Allah's speech, which He delivered to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, through Angel Jibreel. It's important to understand this. What later happened is that a group would emerge, the Mu'tazila. And they would create this new opinion that clashes with the understanding of the predecessors and this pristine belief. And they posited that Allah did not speak the Qur'an. Their belief was that Allah created the Qur'an. Before this point in Ahmad's life, the Mu'tazila, this group, they were to some extent clandestine, they were hidden with respect to their beliefs, because they, they were afraid of the Khalifa, Harun al-Rashid, and, and he was so severe on them. And he himself, Harun al-Rashid, was on the theology of the predecessors. In fact, Harun al-Rashid had threatened to kill Bishr al-Murisi, who was an advocate of this belief of al-Mu'tazila. He said, if I, if I get my hands on him, I will kill him in the most brutal of ways. So their, their beliefs were quite hidden up until this point. And this is the exact reason why Bishr al-Murisi, despite his activism in, in promoting his theology that the Qur'an is created, he had to remain in hiding during the reign of Harun al-Rashid for around 20 years. But when Harun al-Rashid passed away, things began to change. Muhammad, the son of Harun, came into power. His nickname is Al-Amin in the books of history, Al-Amin. And it was only when Al-Amin passed away and his brother assumed the position of Khalifa, who was Abdullah, son of Harun, that Bishr was able to come out with his beliefs. Bishr was able to come out of his hiding and to become a lot more forthcoming in his views. And the Mu'tazila did as well. And they even managed to persuade Al-Ma'moon, the highest authority at the time, to accept the belief of the Qur'an being created, Al-Ma'moon would be another Khalifa to assume the position of Khilafah. Al-Ma'moon, at first, he was hesitant about imposing this view upon the Muslims. But then with time, he would eventually find the courage to do so. So he instructed the leader of his police forces, Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, to begin an inquisition with respect to people's belief about the Qur'an. He wanted people to believe it is created, which is, of course, an innovation. He started with the seven famous scholars of Baghdad, and unfortunately, by the Qadr of Allah, they all succumbed and professed to this new belief under duress, of course. The trial began to spread all throughout Iraq. It reached Khurasan, uh, Al Hijaz, the Arabian Peninsula, and people were being interrogated. The Inqu Inquisition was getting worse. Prisons began to fill. People began to die. And the majority of the scholars were testifying to the correctness of this belief. As we said, under duress, under coercion, compulsion. But there were several figures who stood firm. And two of them were Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and Muhammad ibn Nuh, who was a young student of Imam Ahmad. So upon hearing this, Al-Ma'mun, the Khalifa, instructed Ishaq, the leader of his police forces, to send them both to him. They were refusing to budge or to accept this belief, even outward, outwardly. Imam Ahmad said, I used to make so much dua to Allah that he never shows me the face of Al-Ma'mun. Because news was conveyed to me that Al-Ma'mun used to say, if I see Ahmad, I will cut him piece by piece. So Ahmad and Muhammad ibn Nuh, they were arrested, they were fettered in chains, and they were taken now to meet the Khalifa Al-Ma'mun. But during the journey, Allah responded to the dua of Ahmad and news was conveyed to Ahmad that Al-Ma'mun had just passed away. Ahmad praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he believed that this would be the end of the ordeal, alhamdulillah, not knowing that this was just the start of the ordeal that he would go into, that he was going to experience. News was then conveyed to Ahmad that after Al-Ma'mun, Al-Mu'tasim had now become the Khalifa. Al Al-Mu'tasim, he is Muhammad, son of Harun al-Rashid. They're also father sons of Harun al-Rashid. 
and that this Khalifa had an advisor from the Mu'tazila group, the sect, his name is Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad, who believed that the Qur'an was created. So Ahmad and Muhammad ibn Nuh, again they were summoned, fettered in chains, taken to Baghdad, and they were arrested. And during the journey, Muhammad ibn Nuh, he began to suffer the throes of death. And during his last moments, as his soul was leaving him, he turned to Ahmad. He said to him, Anta rajulun bihi. You are a man who has a following. And all of creation have extended their necks in order to see what you shall say. And so Ahmad fear Allah and remain patient according to or in, in the face of anything that Allah sends your way. Muhammad ibn Nuh passed away, leaving Ahmad all by himself to endure the dark trials ahead of him in his lonely, in his lonely state. Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad, whom we said was the advisor of the new Khalifa al-Mu'tasim, who believed in this creed that the Qur'an was cr created, he advised al-Mu'tasim to subject Ahmad to an inquisition. And so Imam Ahmad was jailed in Baghdad in the month of Ramadan, and Ahmad was already very ill at the time, and he remained in the prison for two and a half years. Imagine. And then when it became a little bit too much for the family of Ahmad, the uncle of Ahmad ibn Hanbal, his name was Ishaq ibn Hanbal, visited the chief of the police. And he interceded for his nephew. He said, look, I mean, at least give him the opportunity to debate the scholars. Let him, give him a chance to voice his opinion. So the leader of the police, who we said is Ishaq, he went to Al-Mu'tasim, the Khalifa, and he said, do you seek permission? And he said, we give you permission to bring Ahmad. So Al-Mu'tasim summoned Ahmad. And Ahmad came in heavy chains in this journey, barely able to walk, Ahmad said, because of how heavy the iron was on his body. And he said, I would fall because of it, and nobody was helping me. And he was taken to Al-Mu'tasim, and they stopped off in the journey uh, during the night, where they put Ahmad in a dark room with no candlelight. And in his shackles, he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and implored him for assistance. The next day, Ahmad was taken into the presence of the Khalifa himself. Now, Al-Mu'tasim, he enters into his royal uh, presence, which included Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad, this, this forged scholar, and the military leaders of the Khalifa, and his companions, and his generals. Ahmad requested permission to speak, and it was granted. Al-Mu'tasim then instructed his scholars to, res to refute him, to address Ahmad. Ahmad is saying the Qur'an is not created, it is the speech of Allah. And after each of Ahmad's arguments, they would just turn to the Khalifa and they would say, Ahmad is an innovator, Ahmad is astray, and he is leading others astray, he is accusing you of disbelief. It was becoming apparent to Al-Mu'tasim, the Khalifa, that Ahmad was overcoming them. And so they were resorting to these insults and accusations. It's always the way of those who are penniless when it comes to knowledge and understanding. Ahmad would turn to Al-Mu'tasim the Khalifa, however, and he would say to him, leader of the believers, they have not cited anything from the Qur'an or the Sunnah. Where is there evidence for what they are saying? And every time they said something, he said, where is there evidence from the Qur'an and from the Sunnah? And so this infuriated Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad. And he said to Ahmad ibn Hanbal, are your opinions taken only from the Qur'an and the Sunnah? What is wrong with you? So Ahmad ibn Hanbal said to him, can the religion of Islam stand on anything but the Qur'an and the Sunnah? La ilaha illallah, standing firm like a mountain. Imagine, no wife, no children, no family, fettered in chains, royal courtyard, uh, enemies, threats of being killed. But Subhanallah, Allah was with him. Al-Mu'tasim scholars urged the Khalifa to execute Ahmad, claiming that he was a heretic. But Al-Mu'tasim was hopeful that Ahmad would accept his beliefs one day because he recognized the status of Ahmad and the importance of having a man like him by his side. The debate lasted for three days, all by himself in his lonely, isolated and imprisoned state. Ahmad was in a state of fasting, only eating the minimum to keep himself alive. To make things worse, Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad, 
made sure to continually terrorize Ahmad ibn Hanbal by saying to him, the Khalifa is going to torture you, it's coming. The Khalifa is going to execute you, it's coming. But Ahmad's reliance was upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By the end of the debate, the Khalifa, Al-Mu'tasim, realized that Ahmad's views were not going to be shifted and his arguments were strong. And so he instructed his men to imprison Ahmad. Then came the instruction that the apparatus for torture was to be prepared. And the punishment began. And between every round of torture, they would say to Ahmad, what do you say with regards to the Qur'an? And he would simply respond by saying, it is the speech of Allah. And sending upon himself another torrent of lashing that would cause him to lose his consciousness. During one of the awakenings of Ahmad, when he came back into consciousness, because of the pain, Al-Mu'tasim said to him, Ahmad, woe to you, you're killing yourself. Woe to you, just accept what I am saying to you and I will personally unshackle you. Ahmad didn't answer him back. Khalas surrendering to the decree of Allah. So Al-Mu'tasim instructed his men to continue lashing him. And he screamed at his men saying, Awja'ah! meaning hurt him may Allah sever your hands hurt him and so they were hitting him as hard as they could and again Ahmad would lose his consciousness and he would and he would pass out they lifted the body of Imam Ahmad they threw it on a straw mat landing him face down and they began to step on him and at this point it occurred to Al-Mu'tasim that he may have just killed Ahmad and this terrified him Subhanallah. It's as if some sense came into his mind. And he instructed that Ahmad to be released. Ahmad said, at this moment, I was completely out of my senses, unaware of what was happening in the world around me. When all of a sudden, Ahmad said, I woke up in a, in a room and the chains were taken off me and I was clothed. And Subhanallah, Despite the constant whisperings of Ahmad ibn Abi Du'a to the Khalifa saying, kill him, execute him. Al-Mu'tasim decided to free Ahmad. And he clothed him with expensive royal attire. Subhanallah. And he set him on an animal to go back home. When Ahmad ibn Hamal arrived back home, instantly he took off all of this expensive attire and he sold it and he gave its value in charity. What happened is that Al-Mu'tasim, the Khalifa, he fell into regret for what he had committed against Ahmad. And so he would send his men to Imam Ahmad on a daily basis to see how he was doing and if there was anything that he needed. SubhanAllah, how the tables turn and how events change. After the passage of some time, Ahmad's body, alhamdulillah, had recovered from the lashing and the injuries. So he was able to go back into the public again and pray with the Muslims in the masjid. He was able to teach, mashallah, and to continue with his life as normal. Till Al-Mu'tasim, the Khalifa, passed away. Then Al-Mu'tasim's son would come into power. His name was Al-Wathiq, nicknamed Al-Wathiq. He became the Khalifa. And sadly, this would begin a brand new chapter of suffering in the life of Ahmed. Al-Wathiq was a fear advocate of this creed that said that the Qur'an is created. And again, Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad was his, was his advisor. And the Khalifa was more committed to Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad than even his predecessors. So he tortured many people and imprisoned many on account of this. And he caused so much suffering in the city of Baghdad. During this period, a letter was conveyed to Imam Ahmad from the leader of the, the chief of the police saying, the Khalifa, Al-Wathiq, the leader of the believers, has made mention of your name, La ilaha illallah. So what would Ahmad have to do? He, would force, he was forced to go into hiding, where he would not visit, or he would not be visited by anyone, nor would he even be able to pray in the masjid, hiding homes. And he remained in this situation till Al-Wathiq passed away. A life of suffering, a life of fitna. But Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, we hope, wanted to give him hasanat that could not have been acquired without it. After Al-Wathiq, the Khalifa, died, came a man nicknamed Al-Mutawakkil, Khalifa. He was a Sunni, Alhamdulillah. He was upon the way of the predecessors. And so Ahmad was freed. The trial had finally ended. The Sunnah was victorious. 
and the international hero was Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Allahu Akbar. Mahanna ibn Yahya, he said that when Ahmad was set free, I saw uh, Yaqub ibn Ibrahim al-Zuhri kissing the forehead and the face of Imam Ahmad. And I saw Sulaiman ibn Dawood kissing the forehead of Imam Ahmad. People were coming to greet this great Imam, soldier of Allah, this defender of the Sunnah, Muhammad, uh, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, may Allah be pleased with him. Al-Mutawakkil also sent a sum of money to Ahmad. Ahmad donated the whole amount of money to the poor along with the bag which was sent which it was sent with Allahu Akbar and Mutawakkil also invited Ahmad to visit him but Ahmad wasn't inclined to doing so and he told him that he was ill he was ill the Khalifa insisted that you come and visit me so Ahmad made his way in the midst of a huge entourage which the Khalifa sent and there in the royal palace a huge table of food would be offered for Ahmad on a daily basis and Ahmed didn't even take a glance at it. He didn't touch any of the food. No interest. Speaking about this fitna, this experience, this trial of Imam Ahmed and what he did for the Sunnah, how he defended their religion, Bishr ibn al-Harith, he said, if it wasn't for this man, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, shame would be upon us till the day of judgment. And Abu Bakr al-Ashram, he also said that our friends, they believed that the, the position of Imam Ibn Ahmad, uh, Imam Ahmad Ibn Hanbal, and Abu Bakr Ibn Al-Ashram, he also said that our friends, they saw that the station of Imam Ahmad Ibn Hanbal during the trial, and what he did for the religion, was similar to the station of Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, during the trial of the apostasy, and what he did for the religion. They said we would make that comparison. And Abdullah, the son of Ahmad, Interestingly, he said, I used to frequently hear my father saying, May Allah have mercy upon Abu Haytham. May Allah Almighty forgive Abu Haytham. Who was Abu Haytham? See, brothers and sisters, Imam Ahmad, he wasn't afraid of the prison. He said, The house and the prison is the same thing for me. And he wasn't afraid of execution either. Ahmad was scared of the whip. And on the day when he was summoned for a session of lashing, he felt someone tugging at his clothes from behind. He looked back and the man said to him, do you know who I am? Imam Ahmad said, no. The man said, I am Abu Haytham. I am the free soul. I am the infamous thief. And to date, it is on record that I have received 18,000 lashes on my back. And I have shown patience towards this in obedience to the devil and in the cause of worldly gain. So you are the Imam. You are to show patience because you are in, in the cause of Allah and in the cause of religion. This gave strength to the heart of Imam Ahmad. So he would also say, Ya Allah, have mercy upon Abu Haytham. He was proactive. The thief was proactive despite his situation. See, proactivity is a universally admired trait. Even if we aren't blessed with it, we admire people who, who, who are proactive. We wish to be like them. So we can ask the question, if it is so universally admired, why is it that some of us still fail to live a proactive Muslim lifestyle? We could blame genetics, sometimes we blame circumstances, a lack of knowledge, a lack of courage, bad upbringing, a mix of it all. But at times, the reason why we're not proactive is for a reason far simpler than all of that. Because we belittle ourselves. What am I? Who am I? What am I going to do? Yeah, so you have this desire to be an initiative taker and to live proactively with purpose, with vision and energy. But you're shackled with these whisperings of who, who am I to do so? Like what, what value could a person like me possibly add? But hold on a minute. That story you just heard of Abu Haytham, the thief, that just pulls the rug from beneath every excuse because despite his sins, his theft, his crimes, 18,000 lashes for them, he did not deprive himself from acting proactively. And as a result, his words would have a tangible effect in strengthening the heart of Imam Ahmad when he needed it most. And therefore, that thief qualified himself for a dua from the Imam, which we envy him for. We wish we had that dua. And the books of history have eternalized his words because of a single moment of proactivity. So why do you belittle yourself? Remember that you are not the product of your 
circumstances. No, you are the product of your decisions. And, and so with paradise as a prize, our decision must be to live a life of motivation and vision setting and planning for the religion and unlimited proactivity.